Good morning, and welcome to the Endocrine Society's Aging News Conference on Monday, the third day of Endo 2019. We're thrilled to have you all with us today. Um, and we're very pleased to have with us this distinguished panel of speakers, Dr. Clifford Rosen of the Maine Medical Re Center Research Institute and the writing group chair of our new clinical practice guideline on pharmacological management of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. Um, that's going to be unveiled for the very first time in this session. And we also have Dr. Boo Yap, a professor at the University of Western Australia's Medical School, Dr. Katerina Borer of the University of Michigan, and Dr. Manasi Das of the University of California, San Diego. So thank you all for joining us. Over the next 35 minutes, each speaker is going to present their findings. We will have one Q&A session at the end of today's news conference. Please note this is being broadcast live on the web at endowebcasting.com. Um, for the convenience of those who are joining us via the web, we just ask that everyone please speak into the microphone and say your name and affiliation before you ask any questions so everyone can follow along on the webcast. Um, for those of you who are joining us online, welcome. You'll be able to type your questions into that platform and then we'll pose them during the Q&A at the end of today's news conference. So I'd now I'd like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Rosen, to the podium. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I've been here for a while. <laughs> let's see. So um, let's see if we can get our slides up. So we've been blessed with just absolutely spectacular weather. Um, and this is my sixth day here. So, okay. Great. Thank you. So um, we're gonna, I'm going to talk just a little bit about what we're going to present at 9:15. And these, this is the product of um, a significant amount of work by many of us uh, over the past five years. Um, we were trying to come to some consensus on a guideline in clinical practice for osteoporosis, and this has been a, um, a major undertaking that's involved a number of different groups. Um, let me see. Okay. So um, I'm the uh, chair of the Guideline Writing Committee. Uh, I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest. I do sit on the FDA advisory board for new drugs and uh, reproductive medicine, which include uh, osteoporosis medications. Um, and I'm an editor at New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, we uh, subsequently were very careful in um, selecting individuals, uh, five content ac experts representing endocrine and epidemiology, and we had one methodologist. So the evidence-based recommendations were developed and graded uh, using the grading uh, recommendations that uh, most uh, societies are using now, uh, the grade approach. Uh, and we performed two systematic reviews and one meta-analysis. Um, one of the newer things we've done besides synthesizing the evidence derived from the randomized control trials, and we only use randomized control trials for evaluating the efficacy and safety of these drugs, is that we evaluated values and preferences relative to the management of osteoporosis. So what we were trying to do is understand what individuals wanted in osteoporosis treatments. Um, one of the biggest concerns we have in the field is that people are not taking their medicine. They, some are not even being prescribed medication, but even those that are prescribed and have severe disease, they oftentimes will not continue their medications. And so what we wanted to try to do was understand who those individuals were, but more importantly, from previous studies, identify what their major priority was. What is it about these drugs that, um, that made them uh, relevant and important to continue to treat? So this is the uh, meta-analysis showing the risk of fracture. And uh, simply put, if you look to the left of the uh, vertical line, um, you'll see that the efficacy is rated from a scale of zero to one, and the lower the the score, the greater the efficacy, and the squares represent the mean values. So it's clear we have drugs that are safe and effective. Um, we've developed an algorithm for the management of postmenopausal osteoporosis that hopefully people can follow. It's quite convoluted, uh, but, uh, but simply put, we divided individuals into low to moderate risk individuals uh, and uh, those uh, individuals would be uh, selected for therapy with bisphosphonates 
and or denosumab. And in those high to very high risk individuals, those that had low bone density and multiple fractures, um, we uh, recommend uh, the treatment with an anabolic treatment such as teriparatide or abaloperatide. So the key points um, in this um, uh, meta-analysis and in our summary is that high-risk individuals, particularly those with previous fractures, should be treated. And bisphosphonates are the first therapeutic choice for postmenopausal women, although denosumab is another option. Uh, one has to reassess fracture risk after being on bisphosphonates for three to five years, so providers should um, consider uh, their fracture risk evaluation, which includes a history of previous fractures. And patients who are on bisphosphonates who are at low to moderate risk should be considered for a, a bisphosphonate holiday after being reassessed by their physician. Um, we do recommend anabolic therapy as an initial form of therapy for those that are very high risk with multiple, more than one fracture. And calcium and vitamin D remain a, uh, a supplement that are very important for uh, maintaining uh, individuals on osteoporosis treatment, and we recommend that it really be in the diet if possible or via supplements. And uh, we suggest monitoring high-risk individuals with a low BMD after one to three years. Um, one of the things we found was that the most important thing patients tell us is how uh, how effective is the drug. They want to know how effective it is. Less important to them is, um, is the um, uh, cost, which was a bit surprising to us, that cost was not a major uh, uh, risk. And then, uh, obviously, safety is important to them, but how they take their drug. Um, so uh, oral medications are preferred, uh, and they're preferred at less frequent intervals uh, of therapy. So some illuminating aspects to the other part of the equation, not just telling providers how they should prescribe, but also trying to provide some insight to the providers about what patients are feeling about in, in embarking on a, what's almost a lifelong therapeutic approach to treating osteoporosis. And I think with that, I'm done. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Rosen. I'd now like to invite Dr. Yoop to this, the podium. All right, well, um, thank you for, to the Endocrine Society for the opportunity to present this work to you. And I'd like to say straight up that, you know, this is research that was undertaken by a group of collaborators, not just myself. So I'm really presenting on behalf of all my colleagues and collaborators from Perth and Sydney, and also from Queensland, all in Australia. And the work that we've done is really looking at the endocrinology of male aging and specifically the role of sex hormones and how this might affect health in aging men. And this is a question that we wanted to address. We know that as men grow older, they have lower sex hormone levels, particularly testosterone. And we also know that as men grow older, they become more and more vulnerable to all the comorbidities of aging. And there is an association between low testosterone in men and the incidence of stroke and depression and dementia. This is all the work that we, as well as others, have published. So the question we wanted to ask was, you know, do sex hormones modify the process of biological aging? And is that why there may be a link between low sex hormone levels and increase in comorbidities in older men? So um, we know that testosterone is the major male sex hormone or androgen, and in the circulation it's carried on sex hormone binding globulin, a carrier protein. But we also know that testosterone is converted to dihydrotestosterone, which is a more potent androgen, and it's also converted to estradiol by aromatase. And androgens are important in men for muscle mass, strength, hemoglobin. And estradiol is also really important in men. We know that it has a role in bone density and also in the regulation of adipose tissue in the body as well in adult men. Now, we, 
when we talk about aging, our main interest is in biological aging. So this is the capacity of the organism to preserve itself over time. It's different from chronological age, and the simplest expression of this is when we see people who look a lot younger than their age in years. They're probably biologically younger, they're aging well. And when we want to measure this, one way of doing it, which is quite robust, is by looking at the length of telomeres. And telomeres are DNA protein complexes at the end of chromosomes. They are essential and they protect chromosomes from damage um, and from degradation. And telomeres shorten with aging. When they are too short, the cell becomes dysfunctional and senescent. So the longer your telomeres, the younger you are biologically. The shorter your telomeres, the older you are biologically. And there is some experimental evidence from cells and from mice that perhaps estradiol actually regulates telomere length in experimental settings. So we wanted to test this in man. So these are, this is the Health in Men study from Western Australia. And we had 4,248 men, and they were aged 70 to 89 years when they, we assessed them. And we measured sex steroids using mass spectrometry, and we measured telomere length using a PCR method. And of the 4,248 men, um, some men were, had medical conditions or drugs that would have interfered with um, their tes testosterone and estradiol levels. Some men actually were very happy to give us plasma and serum for the study, but declined to give us um, DNA, which is fine. And that's why um, there are 514. Most of those men just simply didn't um, to donate DNA to the study. So that left us with about 3,000 men, and we finally did the analysis on 2,913 of them those men who were aged 70 to 84 years. And these are the results. If we look at testosterone and the length of telomeres, there isn't actually a correlation, nor is there a correlation with dihydrotestosterone and telomere length. But estradiol is positively correlated with the length of telomeres. So if you're an older man, the more estradiol you have in the blood, the longer your telomeres are, the younger you are biologically. And sex hormone binding globulin has the inverse relationship. The more binding protein you have, the shorter your telomeres are. Now, what we then did was look at this in a multivariable model. So in this model, we include adjustment for age, body mass index, cardiovascular disease, all the other cardiometabolic risk factors. And we can see that the association of sex hormones with telomere length is robust. It's independent of all these other co-variables. And what this also shows is that the magnitude of the association is actually quite considerable. So having more estradiol, a one standard deviation high estradiol, is associated with having longer telomeres, and that effect is comparable to being younger or slimmer. Conversely, having a higher sex hormone binding globulin, the effect of that on your telomeres is comparable to being substantially older or fatter. So these are actually quite significant effect sizes. Um, so these are the conclusions. Um, high estradiol is associated with longer telomere length, and you see the inverse with sex hormone binding globulin. So the conclusion is that sex hormone exposure is related to lower biological age in older men. And we find this is a really interesting and exciting finding. And the question that brings up is, I mean, this is an observational study, so the question that brings up is whether treatments which impact on sex hormones might actually modify or slow the process of biological aging. And that will be the next thing that we are try we'll try and tease out. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yap. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Borer to the podium. Thank you very much. You're so in this study, uh, I was interested in the relative influence of loading, which is a very important variable in bone health, um, uh, stimulating accumulation or accrual of mineral, as well as timing of meals and um, bone health. So how do I advance it? This one, okay. So basically, that's what I asked, uh, whether the higher me mechanical loading, which we achieved by making the treadmill go downhill, uh, promotes better osteogenesis, the, the sort of ratio of markers of bone formation to bone resorption, 
and whether um, yeah, and that was contingent on the fact that uh, first of all menopause means uh, um, uh, withdrawal of estrogen which is bad for the bones and second of all combinational diabetes which makes bone more vulnerable to breakage even though uh, many of the uh, diabetic women are heavy which is normally beneficial for the bone so the strategy we used was with did the trials where we compared downhill exercise to uphill exercise. It was very short, just 40 minutes. And since we had to keep people happy for 24 hours, they were fed two meals and had two exercise bouts of 40, 40 minutes each. And uh, so we then looked at whether feeding them before exercise or feeding them after exercise was more beneficial. So basically there were these four combinations and there was a sedentary trial where no exercise took place. So how did we do the downhill? Um, I, um, you know, some of my colleagues said you could have just used cinder blocks, but actually we have good engineering department at University of Michigan and some of the students there undertook this, um, you know, uh, mechanical uh, rigging of the, uh, using a jack basically to, to lift the treadmill up. So it was minus six degrees downhill or plus six degrees uphill. So um, we also adjusted the effort. So going uphill, you know, intuitively you think that you will work harder and that it's gonna be more beneficial, but actually you are unloading the bones because you are going against gravity. However, in terms of effort, they did 75% of maximal effort. We measured their um, uh, capacity. And going downhill was only about 48% of maximum effort but much more loading. The way we tracked loading was that one of the co-authors, Dr. Kranozek, gave us these mechanosensitive insoles so that they could actually, we could measure peak uh, ground reaction forces and they were different. They were about 1,200 approximately going downhill and about 800 uh, newtons going uh, uphill. So uh, this is the population we dealt with, 15 women. It's very hard to get diab diabetics to participate in research. Uh, they, you know, they're protective, they're vulnerable, and so on. As you see, um, let's see now. Uh, they were menopausal, about seven years at least. Uh, they were about 57 years old. They were diabetic. This is their fasting glucose, which would be below 100. Uh, they were, you know, uh, somewhat overweight to obese. Uh, uh, with about 40% body fat. Uh, they were uh, osteopenic in some places using Z-score, which is gender and age adjusted standard deviation uh, measure of osteopenia. So 0.64 is below one. And for the hip also uh, 0.81. So they were fed isocaloric meals, identical calories uh, twice a day, either before exercise or after exercise and interval was approximately one hour. So, what happened? This is the uh, kind of amazing uh, result in that we compared sedentary condition, which is the open markers in each case. If they exercised, fasted before they ate, absolutely no difference between exercise condition and sedentary condition. So if you exercised before you ate, you're wasting your time. However, on the, so, so this, was, this was true whether they went uphill or whether they went downhill. So loading here didn't play a role. However, if you exercised after you ate, so here's the meal at 10 o'clock, and here's the exercise at 11 o'clock, and this was repeated with a meal at 5 o'clock and exercise at 6 o'clock. Um, going uphill, it was interesting. Nothing happened after the first exercise episode. But after the second ex meal and exercise episode, there was a difference. There was a beneficial effect. So what is the beneficial effect? We were measuring marker of bone formation, which is CICP, carboxyterminal um, uh, propeptide of type 1 collagen, a as a, and divided it by the marker of bone resorption, which is so-called crosslinks or uh, carboxyterminal peptide of type one collagen. And uh, that ratio basically was a ratio, a ratio of benefit, estrogenic benefit, uh, I mean osteogenic benefit. So that the most interesting result was if they went downhill. Now here, after the meal, within one hour, you have a huge increase in the 
this manifestation of positive bone response, even though they are menopausal and even though they are diabetic, and nothing after the second meal. It's because the bone is refractory. The bone responds to uh, efficient or effic uh, efficacious mechanical stimulation um, vigorously, but over a short period of time, and then for about seven or eight hours, it becomes refractory to mechanical stimulation. So if you want the best bang for the buck, the best deal would be to exercise downhill within one hour after exercise, after meal, within one hour after meal, going downhill, because then you get a very large osteogenic response. So why is this interesting? It's interesting because number one, people don't think that postmenopausal bone is responsive or um, reacts very um, positively to mechanical stimulation or anything. Actually, the biggest outcome here was the suppression of resorption marker, CTX. Uh, and that, was, that has been known for a while, that at night we have increased res bone resorption. The marker goes way up, and during daytime it goes down because of meals. It's a con a connected to meals and may be connected to a gut peptide go called GLP-2, which unfortunately I didn't measure. But either way, the take-home result is that if you uh, want you're know, postmenopausal, diabetic, and want to do something good about your bones with or without doubt supplemental medication, the best thing would be to exercise downhill about one hour after eating and get a big beneficial effect. So that is basically, I think, um, uh, the conclusions that meal eating definitely suppresses this uh, bone resorption uh, agent, CTX, a marker, and we confirm that. And the timing of meals is critical. Most people ignore that, and they think that exercise first thing in the morning. Actually, I did a study with healthy women where they ate at 7 and exercised at 8, and there was absolutely no bone marker response. So doing anything before 10 o'clock may not be worth it. And um, so, again, uh, when you do exercise in post-absorptive or non-fed state, the mechanical stimulation in this population doesn't do anything. But if the exercise is performed within an hour of eating, it is beneficial, especially if the loading is increased. So that's my message. Thank you, Dr. Borer. I'd now like to invite Dr. Das to the podium. Thank you, Jenny, for having me here to share my research with you. So the study is to explore the effect of the time restricted feeding intervention in breast cancer initiation and growth in a mouse model of postmenopausal obesity. And to understand the importance of not just when, what we eat, but when we eat while using intervention for the treatment of breast cancer. As we know, breast cancer is the most common female cancer worldwide, and the global burden of breast cancer is going to increase over 2 million new cases each year by 2030. Breast cancer incidence in Western country is increasing over 30% in the past 25 years, and there are many risk factors associated with the breast cancer. One, on the one side, we can see the unmodifiable risk factor, like gender, age, genetic factor, family history. On the other hand, that is the lifestyle-associated risk factor, among which obesity is a major uh, risk associated with any type of cancer, including the postmenopausal breast cancer. As I mentioned, <coughs> obesity is a potential risk factor for the breast cancer development, and with respect to menopausal status, the, the risk further increased by 40% compared to the pre-menopausal condition. Uh, uh, however, obesity is also associated with poor survival in both pre- and post-menopausal breast cancer women. There are many risk factors associated that links the obesity with the breast cancer. For example, like inflammation, 
hormonal imbalance, uh, metabolic deregulation that leads to insulin resistance, and the deregulation in our daily activities, that is the circadian rhythm. <coughs> so knowing the harmful sequels of the obesity uh, as that leads to breast cancer development, so what could be the like possible approach to treat uh, obesity's harmful effect? So there are many drugs that target obesity. Exercise is also an approach, but more focus has been given now on the dietary intervention because those are that can effectively uh, modulate our lifestyle associated uh, risk. Uh, caloric restriction is one of them that has been implemented, showing some good effect, but nowadays temperature feeding intervention is the upcoming approach for the, obese, uh, for the treatment of breast cancer um, that has been associated with obesity and uh, postmenopausal breast cancer. So our central hypothesis is that like temperature feeding will inhibit obesity-induced postmenopausal breast cancer initiation and growth by attenuating the metabolic deregulation associated with uh, obesity, uh, particularly the insulin resistance. So here we can see that in the left-hand side, when the mouse are feeding on the high-fat diet, like I have symbolized this with the burger, so that that's day-to-day -day we are eating, uh, uh, it, and the mouse is eating that one, the high-fat diet for day and night time. Uh, that is the ad libitum feeding condition. That will, lead to, that will lead to deregulation in the metabolism and, uh, and that will accelerate the tumor growth. On the other hand, we are hypothesizing that time restraint feeding, that is restricting your diet time to a particular time where you are the most active, that is the night time in the mice case, reinforces your, the metabolism that will uh, towards the normal phase, and then that will lead to the reduction uh, of the tumor growth. So with this hypothesis, the, our aim is to test that, like time share feeding will improve metabolic parameter and inhibit tumor growth. Uh, in the postmenopausal obese mice model, fed a high fat diet, <clears throat> and testing the hypothesis that obesity induced Hyperinsulinemia drives uh, mammary tumor growth and insulin may be acting directly on cancer cell growth. So our study design is that we took like the BL6 mice and, uh, <clears throat> and we surgically removed the ovary to generate a postmenopausal mouse model. And with those mouse uh, <clears throat> mice, what we did, <clears throat> we put them on the high fat diet first to make them obese. So the cutoff body weight is like 45 gram for us. And then once they become obese, we switch them to a continuous feeding condition on the high fat diet or a time restricted feeding condition where we are restricting them uh, to feeding for eight hour in the night time. That means the 16 hour of the daytime, they are kind of on the fasting period. So these are the kind of like the cages we are using to implement the time restricted feeding intervention, uh, where the ad libitum mice were having continuous access of the food all the time, and then in the time restricted feeding they have eight hour feeding time and then sixteen hour fasting time. <clears throat> so our s results suggest that like the ad libitum feeding group continuously gain their body weight over time, while the time restricted feeding group reduce their body weight uh, and maintain their body weight, but still they are obese. They are not like reaching to the lean uh, counterpart. Uh, but interestingly, they consume the same amount of caloric intake. That means they are not under any kind of caloric restriction with the time restricted feeding. The glucose sensitivity also improved with the time restricted feeding intervention compared to the ad libitum feeding group. 
the fasting glucose reduced, the fasting insulin also reduced in case of the time restricted feeding group. Uh, the adiposity, that is the measure, like the risk factor for in case of the obesity, uh, we measure the mammary fat tissue, visceral fat tissue, they, this, those were also reduced in case of the time restricted feeding group. So now the next question comes, what's the effect of the time restricted feeding on the breast, uh, the tumor growth itself? So we saw that like the time restricted feeding group significantly reduced the tumor growth in the mice com compared to the ad libitum feeding group, and the tumor growth was pretty much similar uh, to the tumor growth what we are seeing on the uh, in the mice, those are on the normal chow feeding group. The endpoint tumor volume and tumor weight was also reduced significantly. So next we wanted to see like what is the effect of the time restricted feeding on tumor initiation itself. If we like delay the tumor initiation, that is also something very good. So we, for that, we took transgenic mice model that's, uh, that can develop spontaneous breast cancer. And we again put them on uh, either high fat diet continuous feeding group or high fat diet time restricted feeding group, as I mentioned before. And we saw that and measure the tumor volume over time. And we saw that the time ratio feeding group delays the tumor growth compared to significantly compared to the alibitum feeding group. And the endpoint tumor, uh, the weight and the vol volume over time also reduced significantly in case of the time ratio feeding group. To further validate this observation, we also measured the tumor growth over time by ultrasound imaging technique. Here we can see that like the top panel is the ad libitum feeding group where we can see the tumor growth like at as early as like 11 weeks. So this is the tumor and that again like become more bigger at week 11, 15. But with the time ratio feeding group, there is nothing like visible under, <laughs> under the ultrasound imaging until week 15. So, <clears throat> From this, our conclusion is that time pressure feeding reduced breast cancer growth and tumor incidence and improved metabolic deregulation irrespective of obesity. So next we wanted to think like what could be the probable mechanism behind such a tremendous effect of the time pressure feeding intervention. So because we have seen like the time pressure feeding is improving your metabolism and insulin sensitivity, so we thought that maybe insulin is playing a driving factor here and time restricted feeding is acting through that. So to improve that, what we did, we implanted insulin pump that can deliver cons constant dose of insulin throughout the day in the normal chow, or chow feeding group mice. And as a control, we had saline pump implanted group. We injected the breast cancer cell line into the mammary fat tissue to see the tumor grow. Uh, and we saw that like with the insulin pump group, the tumor growth was significantly higher compared to the saline group. So this is the two breast cancer cell line we have used. One is E0771, that is more aggressive, and then one is PY230, that is less aggressive. But even if in the most aggressive and the less aggressive breast cancer cell line we have used, insulin is playing a diverting factor there. To further in, uh, validate our uh, the finding, what we did, we took the mice uh, already become obese uh, by feeding the high fat diet, and then there, what we did, we implanted the insulin pump, like the green panel, and one group was only with high fat diet feeding, and then another group was like high fat diet feeding with a digoxide drug. That's the drug that can reduce your insulin level. So in one group, we have higher in insulin level. In one group, no insulin, uh, like the basal level of insulin. And then one group, we are reducing the insulin level. And what we saw that, like with the insulin <coughs> implant and pump group, the tumor growth was significantly higher compared to the only high fat diet group. And when we reduce the insulin level by using the drug digoxide, the tumor growth suppressed. That means insulin is definitely playing a pivotal role in uh, progressing the tumor growth here, and time-restricted feeding is definitely playing, uh, acting through 
insulin signaling. So our conclusion from this is that like insulin and acting as a driving factor for breast cancer growth in our model. And the summary of the, our study is uh, like time restricted feeding improved glucose and insulin sensitivity. Time restricted feeding uh, is reducing tumor growth and uh, initiation. And the effect of the time restricted feeding on tumor growth is mediated by modulating insulin signaling. And insulin is a potential mitogenic factor for tumor growth and proliferation. So the take home message from our study is that like, it's not just what you eat, it's also important when you eat, when you are trying to um, inhibit breast cancer growth while using any kind of uh, dietary intervention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Das. I'd now like to open up the question and answer session. Uh, please, again, just wait for the mic to come to you and identify yourself clearly um, for the individuals joining us online. Miriam Tucker with Medscape. Um, Dr. Rosen, can you discuss some of the risks um, of some of these osteoporosis medications? And do you think that doctors and patients have been overly concerned about the risks? Well, I think they've certainly been concerned, and rightly so. And I think the perception on the patient side is, is fairly significant that adverse events, uh, for example, why well, take a drug to prevent a fracture when it might cause a fracture? Um, that's a very common uh, response. So we are very concerned about that. Um, and some of the recent data suggests that the likelihood of uh, an atypical femoral fracture, which is the thing that worries most uh, individuals who are embarking on bisphosphonate therapy, remains quite low. There are certain uh, risks that are uh, likely to increase um, an individual's chance of getting an atypical femoral fracture on treatment, and that includes duration of therapy. It's one of the reasons why we uh, have advocated for a drug holiday in many individuals who uh, have been successfully treated for up to three years with a bisphosphonate. Um, the other adverse events are less frequent, uh, including the uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw. But I think the femoral fracture has been the one that's gotten the most attention and is the most uh, disconcerting to an individuals. Um, particularly those who have previously had a fracture and understand the morbidity associated with it and the cost associated with it. From a physician point of view or a provider point of view, it, it, it's, it's hard because you have to spend the time to discuss absolute risk, relative risk differences um, for an individual patient. And you also have to receive signals from the from the individual that you want to treat as to what their perception about risk is and how, how fearful they are. And I, I think that takes time, and in our healthcare system, that's, that's difficult. So many people, many providers default and are reluctant to treat. So both the number of prescriptions has gone way down for antiosteoporosis therapies, as has the number of screening uh, DEXAs. And we, one of the reasons we're concerned is because that's a very good risk predictor um, uh, and so uh, can be uh, utilized in any kind of formula to predict a 10-year fracture risk. So, so I think those combinations in, you know, the Internet is full of stories, uh, and they're real, and uh, we, have to be, we have to understand that, that this can occur but it's, it's quite infrequent, and I think as we learn more about the biology of atypical femoral fractures, we're beginning to appreciate who those people are and uh, educating the individual practitioner. Uh, also for Dr. Rosen, Ted Bosworth from Clinical Endocrinology yes. News. Um, have guidelines been, let me ask a series of questions. Have guidelines been published before? Um, and is this, um, you talked about the key points, a bunch of, uh, but by the phosphates are the first um, Lyme therapy, reassess after three and five years, consider a drug holiday. Are those new, or are those? Um so, um, great question. Uh, it's interesting, we've had guidelines in men before, 
uh, from the Endocrine Society, but this is the first embarkation on women, uh, postmenopausal women guidelines. Um, in at least 10 years, there, there may be something way back, but the first that's really done systematic reviews, and I should emphasize again the importance of our uh, a systematic review of patient uh, 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 attitudes towards uh, drug therapy, because I think that's very novel. Um, I think in respect to what other societies have done or the American College of Physicians, we're close on a couple of uh, the recommendations in terms of the bisphosphonate therapy is still being first line. Uh, and oral is preferable in most of our uh, studies of the women that uh, were involved in survey work. Um, but uh, our newer recommendation in terms of drug holiday is, I think, a little more um, emphasized. And our use of anabolic therapy in individuals at high risk that have had two or more fractures and very low bone density as an initial form of therapy is a, is a new and different um, uh, recommendation from what the American College of Physicians and others have recommended. And finally, is uh, you're presenting them today? Are they being published today? Or yes, soon? they're online this morning. Okay. Yes, I believe so. Nine fifteen. Okay. In the okay. Journal of Clinical Endocrinology Journal and Clinical Metabolism. Can we get a copy? Yes. Great. Uh, and Dr. Borer, can I ask? Um, is this ready for prime time? Is this having clinical, uh, I mean, these are small numbers of patients in general, but do you think that um, you could extrapolate to recommendations to patients about walking downhill uh, well, you know, after a meal? And obviously, I need, need to first publish this. <laughs> this is the presentation. Um, uh, people are reluctant to accept lifestyle options to enhancing their health because they, are, they require more effort and sometimes more thought. Uh, I'm particularly interested in timing of meal eating. My main interest is in energy regulation. And so uh, the take home message here is that really it's not just exercise, any kind of exercise, exercise any time. It is really in case of bones, uh, loading exercise after you eat. And it's the nutrients coming out of your digestive tract that somehow do the magic to combine with the loading. So hopefully when this gets published and when people absorb the message or uh, digest the message, there will be maybe some recommendation to help people who are diabetic and menopausal and taking some of the medications that Dr. Clifford, uh, Dr. Rosen has mentioned combine it with the behavior, because behavior is very easy. It, it's very simple. It is eat a meal, and then within an hour, uh, do some loading exercise. You could also just walk on the level field faster, which increases the loading, really. The, the trick here is to increase the efficacy of mechanical stimulation in combination with food. And is it feasible to do a, a randomized control trial? Oh, Ted, can you well, speak you know, into the mic, please? Randomized control uh, and with outcomes. It would be great. You know, it's all a matter of funding uh, and, uh, you know, logistics. I mean, this study was very difficult to do, to get 15 women do two trials each. And, uh, you know, uh, for instance, the GCRC where I worked at University of Michigan started by subsidizing research and ended up charging us $75 an hour to keep a patient in GCRC. So unless you are really well funded, doing such studies is impossible. You know, unless Dr. Clifford Rosen has a word in no, with no. NIH and can help <laughs> right. us yeah, help us in, in uh, get GCRC more money, it certainly is very worthwhile. But yeah. you know, within my powers, I can't do it anymore. It's the best I can do. Good morning, my name is Sherry Rowan and I'm with Everyday Health and my question is also for Dr. Bohr. I think you just answered this, but can you assume then that um, any type of loading exercise such as strength training would also have the same sort of impact? So the, the greatest misconception, see I'm in school of kinesiology, the greatest misconception is this magic word exercise. Everybody thinks exercise will do everything and exercise is medicine. I fully agree with that. but. It is the type of stimulus that the exercise provides at an appropriate moment in time. With respect to food, with respect to loading, you know, with the, if you swim, 
you do nothing for your bones. If you ride bicycles, you do nothing for your bones because you are unloading the skeleton. So in this context of skeletal health for vulnerable population, it seems that the most beneficial thing is to eat something good. And I'm not even sure what the composition of the diet should be. My diet at that time was 50% 50, 50 carbs, you know, the typical American diet. I have since then switched gears. I am now interested in low carb diet. It could be that bones like low carb diet, you know. What they give to animals when they do the high fat uh, experiments is just a homogeneous high fat diet, which is not really what low carb diet is. You know, it's good fats with a lot of protein and fewer carbs. Carbs may be getting us fat, which may be causing lots of problems, but that's a different issue. So what I'm basically saying here that a good meal followed by exercise that loads the bones is probably the best way once a day, and it's very short. You only need 40 minutes. You don't have to kill yourself exercising two hours because I've done two hour studies and you know they didn't do anything special. So. Hi, Diana from BMC Medicine. My question's for Dr. Yeep if I said that right. Um, apologies if you answered this before, but because your study was done on a specific group of community dwelling older men, um, how generalizable do you think the findings are to other communities? I'm sorry, could you how generalizable? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've actually done two studies. This is the second one, and it's the largest so far. So this is 2,913 older men, 70 to 89. And these men obviously are, have the shortest telomeres and the most vulnerable to comorbidities of aging. And this relationship is very clear in these men. In a previous study, we looked at a smaller group of middle-aged men, also community dwelling. The average age in that study was about 59 years, and we also saw the association. So we think that it's a robust association. You see it in, you know, in middle-aged men, and in this study, you see it very clearly in older men. The, our populations in Western Australia for these studies were predominantly Caucasian or Anglo-Celt. So we can't generalize you know, into different ethnicities without doing those studies separately. Um, there may or may not be geographic variation as well. Obviously, it would be nice to replicate these in different cohorts, different geographic locations, different ethnicities. And obviously, we can't generalize to women either. We are, have to do those studies separately. We did have one question um, from a reporter uh, that's online with us at Endocrine Web, and this is for Dr. Yeep. Um, her question is, does male menopause have an effect? And the follow-up is, is there any action patients can take at this point based on your research? All right, okay. Well, the male menopause, as you know, is pretty controversial. There is a gradual decline in testosterone levels in older men, and there's a smaller decline in estradiol, but, and as we've seen in our study, towards the, you know, in, um, the, in between the, when you go from 70 to about 84, you do see a small decline in estradiol as well. But this is nowhere near like the abrupt you know, cessation of ovarian function that we see in women. Mm -hmm. The lower your testosterone is, the poorer your health outcomes are. Um, what this data suggests is that it not, may not just be the absolute amount of testosterone, it may be how much you convert to estradiol that may also play a role. There may be a complex interaction between the two. In terms of what men can do right now, um, I think until, you know, we need to do randomized controlled trials. We need to have studies where we give men testosterone, see how much they convert to estrogen, and see what the effect of telomeres are. Um, until we've got that kind of information, I guess the best advice we can give to men is stay healthy, do all the right stuff. We know what it is. Um, eat healthily, keep fit, keep active. We are great believers in, in exercise and um, resist, including resistance exercise. So keep as healthy as you can, and that way you're probably keeping your testosterone and estradiol levels close to where nature intended to be. And um, please pressure all everyone you know to fund more clinical trials, better research, so that we can give you more answers. Thank you. And if the study comes up, please volunteer to take part in, in it as well.
Well, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to our wonderful speakers. Um, we will have another news conference at 10 a.m. on reproductive, emerging issues in reproductive health. Thank you.